Well, first of all, thank you all very much for coming to today's uh, seminar. It's certainly a real pleasure and an honor to uh, not only introduce today's speaker, but to have her, along with her colleague, John Petch, who's giving a seminar here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. that I hope you can make, uh, to spend a couple of days with us here at NCAR. I'm sure most of you know, but Julia Slingo, uh, today's speaker, became the Met Office Chief Scientist, um, I guess a little more than five years ago, in February of 2009 where she leads a team of more than 500 scientists working on a very broad portfolio of research that really underpins everything from weather forecasting to climate prediction and climate change projection. So there's many synergies between the core of efforts at the UK uh, Met Office as well as here at NCAR. And so our relationship and our opportunity to work together is a very special one indeed that we want to nurture and develop. Just a few brief words uh, about Julia. Uh, before joining the Met Office, she was the Director of Climate Research at NERC's National Center for Atmospheric Science at the University of Reading, where in 2006 she founded the Walker Institute for Climate System Research, aimed at addressing cross-disciplinary challenges of climate change and its impacts. Uh, Julia has had a stellar career uh, we could stand up here for a long time and, and talk about her many achievements and her many awards. Uh, she's worked at the Met Office, at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, and also right here at NCAR from 1986 to about 1990, which is when I arrived, so I hope there's not a causal link there that when I arrive. Uh, she's developed and used complex weather and climate models throughout her career uh, to understand the climate system and to improve our predictive, uh, predictive capabilities. Her special interests are in tropical weather and climate variability, understanding their influence on global climate system and the role in predictions from monthly out to decadal and longer time scales. So it's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Julia Slingo. Right. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much for coming and, and having the chance to uh, talk to you. And uh, it's, it's great to be back in Boulder, as it always is, and to see many uh, familiar faces. And um, I'm afraid that as it goes these days, as chief scientists, I don't do really very detailed, deep science. So if you're hoping for some very profound bits of science, you're in the wrong place, I'm afraid. Chief scientists end up usually talking about more strategic things and trying to give a big picture of what's going on. And that's what I decide I, I'll do this afternoon because I'm really here uh, primarily to see with Jim now as the new director whether we can reinvigorate our MOU. I think there are some really great opportunities as our science program has evolved over the last few years and our, uh, under our strategy that I set when I came. And now with, I think, your own program evolving and, and uh, the synergies between us are seem to me to get greater and greater. So I wanted to just give you a flavor, and it is literally a flavor of the sorts of things that we've been doing and how they might relate to things that you're interested in too. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the science program, very brief. And then I'm going to talk about what we've been achieving in weather forecasting at the kilometer scale over the UK. I want to talk a bit about near-term climate prediction, by which I mean the seasonal time scale, um, and the role of model resolution. But of course, the role of model resolution goes, long, goes way beyond near-term climate prediction. It applies to all time scales. I thought it would be uh, interesting to look at this whole question of climate disruption and the changing Arctic, and I'll give you, a, I'll show you how we've looked at that as another way in which we do our science. And then finally, I really couldn't come to uh, NCAR and not talk about the pause in global warming, seeing as NCAR, I think, has made a really good contribution to that debate about where has all the heat gone. 
So a whole mix of different problems, in a sense, and different activities. So this is an overview of the structure of our science program. Um, I now have about 530 staff, and my annual budget is around about 45 million. So I don't think it's that dissimilar to NCAR in many respects. And you can see how we now divide our science up into what are now four directorates. But when I came to the Met Office, we had just the Hadley Centre, and we had something called Forecasting R&D, and they operated somewhat independently, despite the fact that we had a unified model and had done for quite a long time. Um, and I decided that we really needed to combine the budgets, combine the science, and work as a fully integrated science program. And we created this new directorate called Foundation Science, which is a science that underpins everything we do between weather and climate. And in there particularly is the global model coupled model development and evaluation, which underpins everything from weather to, to climate in the global sense. So you can see how we've, we've split it up. Of course, it's worth saying that there are things here that are, are very operational. So we do everything right until our new forecasting suites become operational. So there are activities that we engage in that obviously you wouldn't at NCAR. But other than that, I think you'd recognize a lot of this. We also set up this formal thing called Science Partnerships, which was started under Chris Gordon, who was the then head of the Hadley Centre. Um, and, and we resourced it. And we sort of did that because we realised that we can't cover this very broad science base all ourselves. And that, indeed, there's some fantastic work going on in the academic sector, in research council centres, in organizations around the world like yourselves, and that we needed to put in place serious mechanisms that would really aid collaboration. And John Petch is here now, and he leads that. And it's that that we're using, I think, as the basis for our MOU with you and how we might collaborate going forward. So that's what it looks like. And I think we now quantify what we get from that and the gearing that we get for that, that feeds directly into these science areas and then into operations, is around about 15 million pounds per annum, conservatively. So we gear another a third again from having invested in a very structured program of science partnerships. So that's the science program. And you'll be able to see many places where you interact. If you ask what is the Met Office about, well, of course, we are a national weather service. And the Hadley Centre is there to provide a service to government. So we are a service-driven organisation. So everything we do, whether it's from what might appear to be very blue skies research, has as it, at its, its end point delivery of improved services. So we're not an academic organisation. And uh, it was quite a cultural change for me to come from somewhere where if you saw an interesting problem, you could go away. And and follow it. Here we have to do everything to geared towards improving the forecasts, improving the climate predictions, climate change projections. And so the five drivers of our science program are first and foremost about saving lives and livelihoods. So it's all about the National Severe Weather Warning Services. It's about delivering resilience and preparedness. So that's looking beyond just the next five days, but maybe out to a month ahead, a season ahead whatever is needed for, the, for, for making the society better prepared, more resilient. And then there's this whole question about how you make wise choices for future adaptation. And the wise bit is very important, that we need to be sure that the decisions that governments and business take about uh, investing in adaptation is underpinned by the best science. We advise government an awful lot about avoiding dangerous climate change. So that's very much what mitigation policies we should pursue and what the implications are for the planet from various policies that one might look at, including geoengineering, for example. And then last but no means least, of course, very good use of weather and climate intelligence uh, saves money, 
makes more efficient businesses, opens up new opportunities for business. And so a lot of what we now also talk about is how we can support growth in the green economy in the UK. A lot of what we do is hard to define the socio-economic benefits in hard monetary terms because it's all about avoiding costs. But you can do it, and we've done it recently for our supercomputing uh, procurement, where we were able to show conservatively a return on the investment of 20 to 1, which when you look at any other investment in science, it's hard to find an investment, a return on investment of anything like 20 to 1. And, you know, we should use that as a community. You don't have to be a service provider necessarily to show that. That use of weather and climate intelligence across the, all of these areas is, is in, immensely valuable uh, in monetary terms. Of course, the Met Office, I think we're very lucky, and I think the same at NCAR, that we have weather and climate research and services in the same house using the same model. And so if anybody could deliver the seamless agenda that went around the community uh, five, ten years ago as an aspiration, then we should be able to do that. And we now do have a full implementation of seamless prediction across all time scales from a few hours right out to the end of the century. Using the same fundamental modeling system, the unified model, because it's a non-hydrostatic model, um, but obviously the complexity of the model varies depending on the time scale of the prediction you're looking at. Um, but it has enormous benefits that you can actually look at your model's performance here and relate it to what you see as major biases in your long term performance of the model on climate time scale. And we spent a lot of time in the last five years really focusing on what we think is the sweet spot, which is this one month seasonal to decadal time scale. Because that's where most decision makers work. And that's where people will be making the big investments. And it was great to hear Tom Bogdan say that actually that's exactly what UCAR and NCAR are really looking at, is that two-week to two-decade time scale. There's some really challenging science to do out there, but also I think some really big opportunities for us to provide very valuable information. So that's where we all are. And um, one of the other things, of course, is that because we have a unified model and it's non-hydrostatic, we can actually uh, bridge the scales from global to local with the same modeling system. And that, too, is very powerful and something that centers like ECMWF don't yet have. When it was brought in quite a long time ago now, uh, it was caused a lot of sort of discussion and debate in the Met Office. I wasn't there then, but I remember it from Tony, um, because it is, is more expensive. And why on earth did we need to have all this uh, new dynamics, non-hydrostatic stuff? But actually, it's, it's served us incredibly well, because we've been able to implement now, over the last few years, operationally, what is a very, very nice nested forecasting approach. These are the resolutions that we currently run at operationally four times a day, all in ensemble mode, including even at these cloud system resolving scales. We run a 12-member ensemble at 2.2 kilometers for our short-range forecasts. Um, and we shall be shortly moving the global model to 17 kilometers uh, by the end of the year and with a, an upgraded dynamics, which with us, I think, quite considerable uplift in performance. So those are the models that we use. And what I wanted to do was just show you some examples of their um, application, particularly the uh, one and a half kilometer model, which actually has been quite a revolution in weather forecasting for the UK. And look at it in the context of what the UK went through at the beginning of this year. And I'm sure you will have seen this on the news we were absolutely battered, almost continuously, really, from the end of October, but particularly through Christmas, New Year, and right through to the end of February, with a quite extraordinary sequence of storms that were coming through not just on average what, once a week that we might expect, but almost every other day. And these were accompanied by exceptionally high waves. This is Aberystwyth on the Welsh coast, and when my younger daughter Anna was a student here, she had a room in one of these houses, round about where this wave is, 
we had an immense amount of coastal damage, but we also had more rain than we had recorded for at least 250 years. So it was quite an extraordinary spell of weather. And uh, one has to ask, of course, not just with this event, but with many others that we now see around the world, whether natural variations are being compounded by global warming to cause causing more damaging extremes. And it really tested our forecasts and our models to the absolute limit. It was unrelenting. And this is just an example of the sort of quality of forecasts that you now get from the model. And easy to guess, this is the radar image uh, where, where there's a front coming over the country here with some very heavy rain embedded in it. Um, and the model uh, simulation was really capturing a lot of that structure. Now, you wouldn't expect the individual elements of heavy rain to be in the right place necessarily at the right time. This is the flap of the seagull's wings again. So even for a six-hour forecast, you need to run an ensemble if you're really going to talk about the probability of exceptionally heavy hourly rainfall. So we tend to think of ensembles being needed beyond the deterministic limit that Lorentz talked about of a week or so. But actually, as you go down in scale, the need for ensembles comes back at you. But this capability allowed us to really give some very detailed uh, information to the government about the risk of uh, persistence of serious flooding. Most of this part of the country was underwater for several weeks, and we lost the railway line down in the southwest here. At one point, Exeter was completely cut off. Um, Alongside that, of course, also winds, and this is again from the, the 10 meter wind from the model, this case the 12th of February, where we actually put out the only serious red warning this winter, which we, bear, we rarely do because it then activates the Prime Minister and he has to call the Cabinet together and uh, emergency services are activated. A whole lot of things happen when we put out a red warning, but we did for for this part of Wales based on what the model was telling us and we forecast 92 mile per hour winds and actually they recorded 105 in northwest Wales. So it was a very successful red warning that was actually put out quite a long time before the event. What's been really amazing this winter is to see how much our early warning has improved uh, from a few years ago, both from the global model and this. We also, of course, do uh, ocean forecasting. So we run uh, a global ocean and a shelf seas model operationally every day. Um, and we couple it to the Wave Watch 3 model. This was the significant wave heights uh, at one of the times when we had these exceptionally high waves. I mean, unbelievable for the UK. I live very near to the sea at Sidmouth. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. The waves were going up as high as the buildings on the seafront. And here were the, uh, uh, we had a huge depression that filled almost the whole of the North Atlantic. And the fetch of the winds was producing this enormous swell, which was exceeding uh, more than 20 meters. The other thing about it, when we actually looked at our uh, coastal um, shelf seas model, where also we run the wave model, was the period of the waves. They were incredibly long period waves carrying an enormous amount of energy, very, very unusual. The shelf usually breaks up the period of these long waves. The energy in them was so immense this time with these big storms that we had these long period, very energy. There's a picture here uh, of, of the waves coming over the end of a pier. I don't know what these people think they're doing. I would have done that. Um, but nevertheless, um, the damage, the coastal damage was really very, very substantial. And uh, so we did write quite an extensive report on this that is up on uh, our research news pages. They're worth reading if you're interested in this, in particular looking at the global perspective. And actually, as many of you will be aware now, that a lot of what was happening in the UK was tied up with the, uh, the great buckling of the jet stream over... Uh, North America and the very, very severe cold that Canada and yourselves experienced at that time of year. And that was tied back to an area of quite uh, 
uh, unusually active and persistent convection over the West Pacific Indonesian region, which was very unusual and extended actually quite a lot further north than we normally see in winter. So it was able to interact with a subtropical jet, which was being fed then continuously by Rossby wave perturbation. So that's what that covers. But I also felt that it was right to raise the issue of climate change, got me into a lot of trouble. Uh, with the skeptics in the UK, particularly a man called Lord Lawson, who didn't take kindly to this at, at all, and called me this Julia Slingo woman for saying that I had related the floods to climate change, and it was absolute nonsense, wasn't it? Uh, and I'm just a, not, I'm not even a very good scientist. I don't know what I'm talking about. But what was more important, we, did, we said very clearly that it's not possible yet to give a definitive answer on whether climate change has been a contributor. The fact that it's not, we can't give a definitive answer yet doesn't, shouldn't stop us from saying what uh, we think the science is telling us and that the risk is that there is a contribution from climate change. And what, of course, is so difficult in events like that is that you do need models of sufficient resolution that capture the storms and the associated rainfall. So this takes us back to the challenge for our global modeling, our climate modeling. We have seriously got to be able to at least re represent the synoptic systems, the rain-bearing systems. And we said, such models are now becoming available, and that's true, what I've seen here and what we're now doing in the Met Office. They're available, but we can't deploy them at scale yet because of the computing resources we need to do so. Um, but we said very clearly to the government that they should be done, that, that this should be done, because we need a solid evidence base for future investments in flood and coastal defences. This is huge amounts of money we're talking about. And the cost of actually just doing the modeling at a better resolution and more completely is, is a fraction of the cost of what you, we have to invest. And so this, these sorts of ideas and this, this event actually brought into sharp focus what has been our strategy ever since I came and I wrote five years ago that we wanted to get ourselves in a way, both for weather and climate, having a an integrated approach for estimating hazard and risk at the local level. This is already what we implement in our weather systems, our weather forecasting. If it's good enough for weather today, then it has to be the right thing for talking about hazardous weather in the future and its local impacts. It shouldn't be any different. So we've really worked uh, both at the resolution of our global climate model. I think it needs to be down near 20 kilometers to give the right synoptic drivers, whatever, whether it's weather forecasting or climate prediction. And I think that we have learned through our use of this sort of resolution model in weather forecasting that that is actually the resolution you need to be at to really say something uh, robust about the impacts of, of, of rainfall and so forth at the local level. We know even if we run our weather forecasting model for the, the UK at four kilometers, it's not very good. Um, we do need to be down at the kilometer scale. And then of course we need to express that all in terms of probabilities and a risk-based approach, which is very much how we now communicate our weather forecasts, not in terms of the weather, but actually in terms of the impact of the weather on different sectors of society and business and so forth. So we've had a bit of a go at this, and this paper was published, I think, this week, John, in Nature. So we decided to have a go at testing our one and a half kilometer model as a climate downscaler. Because in the UK, we are really increasingly exposed to flash flooding. This is, this is kind of a, almost a new phenomenon, really, when we think about flooding in the UK. Traditionally, it's always been river flooding, fluvial flooding. But what we're seeing increasingly is flash flooding, and it comes from these very extreme, intense, hourly uh, rates of rainfall. And we've got a climatology here. This is the heavy rain, the top up of 5% from the radar. Um, and when we looked, and we then ran the one and a half kilometer model for 20 years, driven by ECMWF reanalyses, and actually it reproduces incredibly well. 
the intensity, duration characteristics of rainfall compared with our radar network. So we know we have a model that's capturing the right characteristics of rainfall. And then we did a 20-year time slice for the end of the century and looked at the change that we might expect in these heavy hourly rain rates. And in winter, there the enhancement is pretty close. If you look for what the actual is now to what the enhancement would be, pretty close to what you would expect from Klaus's Klaparov. But in summer, where our weather is dominated by thunderstorms and convective situations, and the colors are where there's statistically significant changes, so still 20 years, not really enough to do this um, adequately, but we can see that the enhancement is quite a lot larger. In other words, it's super Klaus's Klaparov response. Now that's a very different story if you're planning your flood defenses and your drainage systems and so forth. This needs to be checked with other models, but what it's telling us is that there are major non-linearities here when we get down at these convective scales in what we think the impacts of climate change will be. So I think this is something we've really got to push ahead with. And, uh, and of course it counteracts the overall message from the UK climate projections, which was that our summers will be hotter and drier. And in fact, that may be the mean trend, but in fact, it looks as though the volatility of our summers will increase. We'll have, we will have more hotter, drier summers, but we'll also have wet summers. And when it does rain, we'll get quite a significant enhancement in the hourly rain rates, which will be very challenging. So I think this is something there's a community we have to do more in that be something to see whether this is an area where we could do more work together to see if we can nail this down a bit more. Uh, it's computationally very expensive. I think the more evidence we get from different models, it would be good. Why does this matter? Well, um, again, the relevance of our science. This is the Thames barrier, and this was built uh, after the major East Coast storm surge that killed many, many people. And here are some really pertinent numbers, two billion pounds worth of value of property in the Thames flood plain and so on. Um, and look what's been happening. It was built to protect London for good and all. It was expected to last at least 100 years um, in its current form. But look how many times they've had to close it. And if we look at the time scale, the, the time series from when it opened, here is this last winter, where the barrier was closed almost more than it was open. And it was closed not just for the East Coast storm surge, which is the blue, which was what we were expecting it to be, what we call a tidal surge. It was actually closed for a combined tidal and fluvial, in other words, concurrency of hazards. So this is the other thing that we need more and more to look at, is the concurrency of hazards. The Thames was badly flooded and combine that with very high winds uh, and some spring tides and an east coast storm surge, there is a real risk now of the Thames barrier being overwhelmed. And uh, so we have to now go back, I think, and look at whether this is fit for purpose. And to do that, it's going to need the sorts of modelling that I've just talked about. And I think uh, there are uh, situations in the in this country, the East Coast is good, good examples where similar sort of studies will need to be done. And I think we can join our science together to really get some better estimates of what the vulnerability is. And of course, one of the things that we um, had been playing around with is that we talk about wind, but actually often what we're talking about is wind and rain and waves and so forth. And this is just an example, actually, of some work we did for the Olympics, for the sailing events. We were asked to provide the forecasts for the Olympic sailing events in 2012, which were head, held in Weymouth Bay here, which is protected by Portland Bill. And here we actually went ahead and produced a new uh, forecasting system where we used a, a sub-kilometer model, atmospheric model, and coupled it to a very high-resolution wave model. And it gave what the Olympic sailing people said was the best forecast they'd ever had. But the point about this and why I'm sharing it is that if we're thinking about coastal 
environments and their vulnerability, our major docks, our barriers, our whatever, um, our bridges and so forth, then you do need to have this combination of wind and wave and so on. And so this has led us to a new uh, area of work where we're actually now building what we call a UK coupled environment model at the kilometre scale. And so we're linking up with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and the National, Oceanogra National Oceanography Centre to couple uh, the uh, shelf seas model here to our atmosphere um, through all, all sorts of issues around sediments. This is one of the other big issues and biology. The coastal marine health is a big issue um, in the UK and waves and of course then out with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology we're looking at a much more consistent approach to hydrology and river flooding, groundwater flooding, flash flooding through combining our rainfall forecasts with their river models and groundwater models and so forth. So this is the future we believe for extending our weather forecasting capability for the UK to a truly a, a natural hazards forecasting capability. But if you think about climate impacts then that's the same things that we kind of need to know to talk about the resilience of our, our total, all our environment. And so we've had um, some major new initiatives in this field and of course the environment system that I've just talked about is at the kilometre scale but many of the coupling issues and what we learn from it are relevant to our global earth system modelling capability and we have already in the last couple of years with, with NERC commissioned the building of the next generation UK Earth system model which will be geared for uh, our, um, AR6 and it is truly a collaboration between NERC, academia and the NERC research centres and ourselves where we've each dedicated eight members of staff each to a team of scientists who work in the Met Office under the leadership of Colin Jones who some of you will know um, and he's actually a NERC employee but he lives in the Met Office and we're building this new model and deciding what uh, ocean biogeochemistry will put in it, what ice sheet modelling will do. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to think about can we work together a bit more and compare the performance of our model with your uh, community ESM that you're building. I want to see this start at the with a, a decent physical climate system so that will be challenging because these models are hugely expensive but again I think some test experiments looking at the resolution of the physical climate model versus uh, what we tend to use in earth system models and, and seeing how that changes the earth system feedback so I would be really interested to do that so that's an area I'd be keen to see some exchange of, of expertise. I'm going to take a little sidestep now and of course um, thinking about last winter and thinking about well did we predict it in our seasonal forecasts and certainly way back in October we were talking about uh, a wet and windy winter and warning of uh, some quite uh, severe um, damaging winds and storm surges. But by the time we got to make the forecast for December, January, February, we got it badly wrong. And so did ECMWF. So we weren't picking up some of the things that were actually going on, I would argue, way, way back in the tropical West Pacific. And so it brought me back to a slide that I made, and I looked it up. I made this slide in 2006 when we were just beginning to think about seasonal forecasting. And I think it's always worth returning to this and reminding us of what the individual steps are in when we make a climate prediction. It doesn't have to be a seasonal forecast. It can be a decadal prediction. And looking really at um, particularly remembering that it's not just the SST that actually drives the teleconnections, it's actually this bit of the, the business that drives the teleconnections, that's the transformation bit, and that to get the global circula circulation anomalies you have this bit called teleconnection and then there are all sorts of other bits that go on and ultimately we need to get to this point here. And it's worth sort of noting that the quality of the basic state will determine whether the SST variability is manifested in the right diabetic eating anomaly and how that then interacts with the global circulation to give you those 
the right bits there, and so on and so forth. So it has really forced us very much in the last few years to step back and not just endlessly run ensembles of seasonal forecasts to try and find predictability through larger ensembles, but actually say, can we build a better model? Because an ensemble of poor models is still an ensemble of poor models. And to actually try and understand what bits of the climate of the system are driving this end result. What do we think are the drivers for different, uh, in particularly extreme events that we see? And uh, of course, it'll be no surprise to any of you that I've always been pushing for greater resolution. It's hard to believe that uh, higher resolution won't deliver some significant benefits. And this is just a snapshot of the sort of things that we're now looking at. And I note that they're almost exactly the same scales that you're investigating, Jim, here. Um, we, this is now our workhorse resolution for our climate work, but we're doing quite a lot of work at the 12 kilometer scale. And for things like this is specific humidity, but it could be a tra another tracer or anything like that. The point is that the sorts of resolutions that we tr traditionally run are completely inadequate for the sorts of important structures and mixing, in this case, humidity that we need to simulate. And likewise, for the ocean that we've been testing a quarter of a degree and a twelfth of a degree, a quarter of a degree is a major step change. I think it's almost impossible now to consider running a climate model with a one degree ocean. Now that's not received very well in some quarters, but I think that's where we have to be. That a one degree model is just not planet Earth. We found that the quarter of a degree gives us an awful lot of, of additional benefits, as I'm sure you found too. And the question is how much more do we get when we go to the twelfth of a degree? And maybe this structure in the Pacific is what we should be worrying about, and some of the structures around the uh, Antarctic there. But nevertheless, quarter of a degree is now our workhorse resolution, and it's given us some very significant benefits. And so this is the resolution we're now running at. And the reason I put these in red is because actually it's not just about horizontal resolution, although I think that's really important. A lot of the benefits we've had have come from a better resolved stratosphere. So we've added a lot of resolution and lifted the lid of the model. Um, and so we now have a, an L85 model, which has a really good stratosphere. And equally, uh, this L75, we run the NEMO model. This L75 is something that we built, which has a meter resolution at the top of the uh, ocean mix layer. And, uh, Bill will remember we had a workshop very soon after I arrived at, at the Met Office to look at this issue because work we'd done at Reading over the years had told us very clearly that SE interaction on timescales like the MJO needed that one metre resolution at the top. But actually the more you think about it, this is the ocean's boundary layer. We need to take as much care with the ocean's boundary layer as we take with the atmospheric boundary layer. So. We now, this is our standard setup. And uh, one of the nice results, and I think you're seeing similar things, is this very significant improvement in atmospheric blocking. And uh, that's been a very significant step for us. And actually, it's one of the things that, um, here's a little story, that in 2010, we had a really appallingly cold winter. And the Secretary of State asked from transport wanted to know from the Met Office how often I was going to get winters like that in the next 30 years because he wanted to know whether to invest in snow plows and gritting things and you know it was quite a lot of money and that this infrastructure does last for 30 years so you know is he going to buy it or is he not going to buy it and I had to say to him I can't answer your question because I can't do blocking I can't do this I can't do that give me a couple of years and let's work through the models, improve the models, and I'll come back to you. Now he's not in, he's not there anymore, so nobody's come back and <laughs> asked me the question. He's moved on, but the science is the problem is still there. The point is that why why would I give I could have given him an answer, but it wouldn't have been worth the paper it was written on, because we couldn't do blocking. And blocking is what sets up the snow conditions in winter. So we do need to on occasions step back and say, actually, 
no, I can't answer your question. And these are the reasons scientifically why I won't. But you give me some more money, fund me. I didn't have to say that, but it was, it was in there. Um, and, and we'll come back and give you an answer. Um, and I do think we need to do that and be honest about where the shortcomings are of our science and how much we understand it. Anyway, the uh, point is that over the last few years, we have had, I think, really significant improvements in the skill of our seasonal forecasting. This is just an example of ENSO rainfall teleconnections. And, um, you know, it's not just in the tropical Pacific, it's all around the tropical belt. I don't think we're unusual in this, but these things only come right when the basic state of the model is half decent. And the tropical basic state of our model improved quite significantly with a quarter of a degree ocean because we got the tropical instability waves somewhat represented and the mixing that they do around the cold tongue in the equatorially specific. A more recent result is that we now have skill in predicting the surface North Atlantic oscillation in winter. Important, this is the surface NAO. It's actually much more difficult to predict than say at 500 millibars, but it's the surface where we live and we can use this to tell us about aspects of wind and wave and rainfall. This is the Heinkast set and we now have a correlation of 0.6. It's still not great. It means that quite a lot of the time you won't get it right. And you have to be aware of that. There's a communication issue here. But this is quite a breakthrough from a situation where we thought there was actually no predictability in the Euro-Atlantic sector to what looks like now real glimmers of hope that actually there might be quite a lot more predictability than we thought. This is just the start. How did we get there? Well, we, because we had improved the model and we started to understand some of the things that were driving, for instance, these very negative NEO states that we saw around these cold winters, particularly in the, this one in, in, in 2010. And some of that was tied up with uh, things like solar variability. And this is, I'm going to give this as an example of the importance of this case of high vertical resolution modeling that some new work began to come out uh, that suggested that during the 11 year solar cycle that the ultraviolet part of the solar spectrum changed much more than the total irradiance. And we were actually at the time of these very severe winters in Europe and the UK in what was a very deep solar minimum. And uh, if you look at the observations, what you see in, in typical these extremes of the solar cycle, the cold conditions over Europe, a warm over Greenland, and a very pronounced negative North Atlantic oscillation pattern. And so we were able to go into the model because it had a stratosphere, a decent stratosphere, so it could actually respond to those changes of the interaction of the ozone with the changes in the ultraviolet that was coming from the solar cycle. And look, uh, over some very well constructed experiments, what the minimum maximum differences would be if you if you perturb the UV, and what you got was uh, again the ne the negative NEO pattern, cold temperatures over Europe, many similar and warm over Greenland, so many similarities to the observed uh, uh, characteristics of the response to the 11 year solar cycle. And this is Adam Scaife's work, of course, but what it shows, this is the uh, vertical axis here uh, from the equator to the pole, is the development in November, just when you're going into the polar night, where the uh, perturbations to the UV and uh, interacting with the ozone can change the temperature gradient, this development of easterly anomalies, which then gradually propagated down through the winter um, and into the towards the surface and gives you this, always this ringing of the bell of the North Atlantic Oscillation and the Arctic Oscillation. And the point here is that this would not have been possible without a well-resolved stratosphere in the model. So you have to come back always to saying, now I understand the process that might give me predictability. It's one of the factors that gives us seasonal predictability. Um, it evolves the stratosphere. And actually, time and again, we see the stratosphere being implicated one way or another 
whether it's through Enzo teleconnections and other things. Um, another one, why was the early spring 2013 so cold? So the UK has been subjected to a lot of record-breaking weather. And this one is about, this was a picture of a well, sheep farmer, their livelihood was uh, decimated by this cold spring. A lot of the sheep were buried in very deep snowdrifts. It's lambing time. This was disastrous. And uh, it was, here are our marched rec temperature records back to 1910. We got used over the last 50 years to much warmer springs. Um, and this one was the coldest spring since 1962. And of course, people then said, well, it has to be the Arctic. Is the Arctic disrupting, the warming Arctic disrupting our climate? And uh, this is, I think, a very compelling picture of the just the change in uh, Arctic monthly ice extent. This goes through all the time series, but the brown is the September. And uh, it is very interesting, 2007. If you wanted to talk about tipping points, you might talk about that as a tipping point where the seasonal cycle of Arctic sea ice was changed. So there's been a lot of stuff in the literature uh, about, well, Arctic amplification and leading to more persistent weather patterns in middle latitudes and so on and so forth. And a lot of stuff around, well, is these very cold springs. We've had very wet periods, very cold winters, all tied up with this disruption of the climate system. So we took a look at it. And this is the sea level pressure pattern for that very cold spring. Um, again, um, a negative North Atlantic oscillation pattern. But what about 1962? Almost exactly the same. Perhaps not surprising, because it was a cold March. But when you look at the temperatures, and this is the temperature, surface temperature anomalies, what you see, of course, is very cold conditions over here, warm conditions coming down through the Labrador Sea here, and incidentally you had some pretty cold weather there too. What was 1962? Almost exactly the same. And when you look at loft, you see no evidence of Arctic amplification playing a role. This is quite simply something else going on. We could pretty well eliminate the warming Arctic from this. There is no evidence actually of Arctic warming in that picture. And it comes back again to the good old stratosphere. So what happened was that in January, uh, we had a major southern stratospheric warming. And those easterlies very rapidly penetrated down to the surface. Um, and it was late enough in the season that by this is the stratosphere healing itself, in a sense, as we say. Uh, it stayed easterly all through that period, and very cold. And uh, this is the sort of what you get with a sudden stratospheric warming, you get into this phase of the, um, the less cold stratosphere, the Arctic Oscillation. And these are the patterns of weather that you get associated with that, which are exactly the pattern that we saw in 2013 and we saw in 1962. Of course, I don't, well, it's very hard to know when there was a sudden stratospheric warming in 1962. Maybe if people have got the data, they could tell me, I don't know, but, um, but the point is that this cold Arctic, this cold spring, was tied up with these sorts of processes. And actually, these sorts of things are incredibly useful for us to understand the things that drive climate extremes and climate anomalies. What sort of things should we be looking for our models to be able to simulate if we're really going to be able to talk about climate variability, and particularly climate extremes? and the statistics of those in the future, but also how we predict them on the seasonal and maybe slightly longer time scale. I still think that nevertheless, uh, there were, although this appeared to be part of the natural variability of the system, we still do need to understand what is the impact of the warming Arctic. This is a big change. So again, I think this is an area, Jim, where we might want to revisit again. We're doing quite a lot of work and trying to understand has the wave, have the waves in the middle latitudes become more extreme, more stationary, what's going on, or is it just some other part of natural variability that's happening? I think this is still a major issue that we haven't got to grips with. So I wanted to just end with talking about the pause in global surface warming, because um, 
Um, I'm at the sharp end of climate change science in, in the UK these days, and this is the thing that the rock that's usually thrown at me by the skeptics. And uh, we wrote three, I think, quite comprehensive papers about this last summer to try and explain what might be going on. Um, and the fact of the matter is, this is the global mean surface temperature trace, and this is the bit that we're talking about. If you look at something that's more regional and is in, 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 in many, many respects much more relevant to looking at what climate change might mean for us, this is European summer temperatures. Now, uh, again, for this region, and this is actually the 2003 heat wave, when we plot that, and the black is the observations, where's the pause? We don't see it. Our summer temperatures have continued to rise throughout the period of the pause. So here's 2003. And in fact, if anything, and these are the uh, CMIP-5 models here uh, with greenhouse gases. This is the ensemble without greenhouse gases. Uh, you can see that, in fact, the uh, observations are tracking the upper end of the models. So the idea that the models are all wrong because they're running far too warm we need to be very careful about that and make sure that actually the regional manifestations of global warming are in many ways more relevant and something we should focus on. But nevertheless, what's going on with the pause? Um, this is all well known to very many of you. And as I say, uh, Jerry Meal and people have done some very nice work on this. And what you see here is the sea surface temperature pattern between the 1990s and the 2000s. And we see this classic cooling of the uh, Pacific Ocean in the east here and the warming here and here. This is the classic PDO type pattern. In other words, um, there's variability, there's dynamics going on here that's influencing the global mean surface temperature. This is not just random or anything like that. And um, so there's something here that we need to understand. Uh, if you look at the pressure patterns associated with that, then this is the same thing. We see a remarkable weakening of the Aleutian low, which changes the wind quite considerably over the North Pacific. We also see very big changes down here in the um, South Pacific around the region of the Antarctic. And I think we still need to be sure that we understand the role of that in what's been happening to the Antarctic in, in recent years. They are very clear patterns and, and low pressure over here of uh, uh, the response to the PDO type SST pattern, but also in some respects these changes in pressure will reinforce some of the SST anomalies that you see. So there's an a, a air-sea interaction process going on in the mid-latitude oceans. And again, do we understand it? I think we don't. Um, but what we do know, and increasingly now from observations and models, is that it's quite likely that heat has been sequestered much deeper in the ocean during this decade, albeit there has been also some reduction in radiative forcing of the planet, which has part accounted for some of the pores. So um, here we are today with um, an El Nino. And potentially, if we were looking at uh, I hope, again, you're used to these figures. This is from the tower ray. So this is the zonal wind across the equatorial Pacific as a time series over the last three years. This is the SST. And this is the depth of the 20 degree C isotherm, which acts as a proxy for what's happening around the thermocline. And of course, at the early part of the year, we suddenly saw these big Kelvin waves. They're probably the biggest adjustment of the equatorial Pacific by Calvin wave activity that we've seen since 1997. And of course, that's the last time we had a major El Nino that had an impact on the global mean uh, surface temperature. So, you know, we all got slightly excited and thought, is this the end of the pores? Are we out of the woods here? And will we get a, a new surface temperature record that will shut the skeptics up a bit? <laughs> um, but as time has gone by, we can see that actually the southern oscillation, which you can really see in the response of the wind field, has just not kicked in. And in fact, the southern oscillation has remained largely positive. So this is very intriguing. I mean, this was started off as quite a major adjustment. And you've got the warming here in the east as these Calvin waves reach the uh, 
the eastern boundary, um, just as we would expect, and this warming spreading out. But look at the warming here that's remained, not necessarily wind driven, but something's going on there. And the southern, and the and and I think there is a very big question as to whether this El Nino will just fizzle out. I don't I'm not making a prediction, but I I am very cautious. I think it's unlikely we'll have a strong event. But when you look at the sea surface temperature anomaly patterns in the last what have I got here? The last not quite the last week or so, um, you see something that is very unusual for an El Nino. What you might think of as a developing El Nino, just in terms of SST indices over here, that the water has remained remarkably warm in the West Pacific. And in, in fact, indeed, extremely warm. This, these anomalies are now approaching two degrees up here. So the warmest water is really right up here, exceptionally warm for this time of year. It's actually no surprise that Japan had a major typhoon this week. And so you have to sort of, although this now doesn't look, of course, in many respects, like the um, PDO pattern, so this is the pause period from observations. There are aspects of this where you might think that the PDO is going to change sign. There are aspects of it that are still very much present. And if you look at the pressure patterns, and I haven't unfortunately got that with me, we can see that there's still quite a lot of high pressure up here. And the pressure anomalies that I talked about in this part of the South Pacific are still well in force in their winter this year. So is this El Nino just a sort of trying to grow on what is fundamentally the wrong uh, state of the PDO? So again, um, and what is really happening over here is this part of global warming. Is it that the West Pacific has warmed up just enough that actually to, for, for, for anything that happens over here to overcome this? Uh, I don't know, but the convection activity has remained very strong in this part of the world through this whole period. So these are, I think, some very fundamental questions that we need to get to grips with. The background state, the slowly evolving background state, and what it means for things like El Nino. And again, we've just written a report. So again, it discusses in some fairly gory detail about what we think is going on and what the impacts might be. And uh, here we are. We're actually talking about that the risk of a poor monsoon over India is two to three times greater this year than normal. Um, and I think we will, if we look at what's happening over India at the moment, then this is bearing out. They have had the most terrible start to the monsoon. And they did in 2009 too, when we had a sort of similar El Nino trying to set up against the force of a negative PDO and a lot of warm water in the West Pacific. And this is the anomaly for India. This was yesterday's picture. And we're talking of 50% or more deficient rainfall now, well into July. This is um, a, a disaster happening, I think. And although India is resilient with food, this lack of rainfall is very disturbing. And we've had two years so close together. So these are the burning issues that I think our science needs to get behind. We've got to understand what the oceans are up to and where the heat is moving around the system and how it's interacting now quite subtly, I think, with some of the things that we think we understand like ENSO. So this is a summary of the decadal stuff. Um, I think we have got a big issue here on the decadal uh, variability. We don't have really the observations, but can we use our models in an intelligent way to get some understanding about how the heat moves around the system? Can we do some clever experiments? And I think this is an area where we would be extremely interested to work with you on maybe some uh, comparison experiments and analysis. So here's my concluding remarks. I'm sorry I've gone on a little bit longer. I thought I think we've had major breakthroughs in local weather forecasting and in action looking at the local climate impacts through kilometre scale modelling. And I would like to see that really accelerate. I think there's really compelling evidence now that we do need the higher horizontal and vertical resolution in, in the atmosphere and the ocean to do what we need to do on climate predictability. It's always worth just doing some synoptic climatology 
on ext climate extreme events to understand what might have been the drivers, to get an overall understanding of what bits of the system we need to have right if we think we're going to predict them or even say what the statistics might be in the future. And as I say, I think understanding the cable variability and the movement of heat around the global oceans will be cr critical for near-term climate projection. So if we're serious about doing the next 20 or 30 years, we have got to look at that very, very seriously. So what are the key challenges that I see for the future in my job as chief scientist? Well, um, everybody who knows me knows that I would talk about supercomputing and the government chief scientist, Sir John Beddington, who's recently retired. At every meeting I turned up, he, I thought he'd say, I know Julia's going to ask me for more supercomputing. Um, but actually, in the end, I got it. And they got tired of my asking for it, I think, because we have um, now um, acquired three times our normal investment for our next upgrade. So we have £97 million allocated to our supercomputing facility, which we'll be installing in the next couple of years. And that, for me, is a major breakthrough for our science. Um, we've got to keep getting out there and saying that these numbers are small compared with what we spend on, on uh, dealing with climate change or even observing the planet from space. We do have to keep looking at observations. And I think one of the things that I'm concerned about with going forward with the Met Office is that we've had this massive advance in modeling and down to the kilometer scale. And we've got to make sure the observations keep pace with the modeling, otherwise we live in fairyland. So very much of our next strategy is going to be really about what should our national infrastructure and uh, observational infrastructure look like and how, must, how can we play very strongly into securing global <coughs> observational infrastructure. Forging stronger science partnerships is crucial, I think, for all of us. And that's what I've been here to discuss with Jim today. And then finally, of course, I haven't really talked about this. At the end of the day, our science is being done for society. So we have to realize our collective potential um, to deliver products and service, services that address society's needs for environmental information. And again, that's an area where you're very strong. We're just beginning that journey, I think, in our new Applied Science Scientific Consulting Directorate, um, that translational science that we often need to do. And that's, again, an area that I'm very keen to see us work together on in the future. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, we certainly have time for a few questions. This is being recorded and broadcast, so just give me a moment to try to get the microphone to you. As crowded as the room is, we're going to have to rely on people passing it along. So, questions for Julia? Lawrence. Hi, Julia. Great, Hi. great, great talk. Um, do you think we're at a place where the fundamental hypothesis on climate attribution has changed from being we need to prove that there is a climate element to various things to other people need to prove that there isn't? I think certainly, I don't know what it's like in this country, but in the UK there has been a very big shift in the last year or so in the skeptic community from saying we accept the climate is changing and we accept that humans are contributing to it, but actually we don't think it's going to be that bad because your models are wrong and they all run too warm. And we think that actually won't be any more than one or two degrees and that's really good for us, isn't it? And that's where the argument has now gone and that the economics of mitigation uh, just don't stack up, they say, and that it's because it's not going to be really so bad, we just carry on as usual and adapt. And that's where the argument's got to. So we've, um, I don't know what it's like here, but I think the overwhelming acceptance now in, in the UK is, is one that says, yes, we know that humans are a major contributor to global warming. Just a quick comment there as well, Julia. Um, the 
uh, the current situation in the United States is now significantly over 50% of rabid rub Republicans now believe not only is it a problem, but there should be something done about it. So I the shift is shifting. happening. Yeah. And as you uh, as you saw last uh, week and the week before in in the UK, big business has now said we got oh, a problem, yeah. and if big business has got their profit margin on the line, it's a whole different situation. Yeah. I, I think they're really big moves, and it's great to see big business standing up and saying we're taking this really seriously. But the question, or the question I want to ask of you, very early on, you talked about the uh, the severe weather in the UK and said you had your yet in um, in italics. Um, there is no evidence yet that uh, this is definitive evidence. I definitive think. evidence. I know, and I, I it was really important. I know, and I fully agree with that. Um, and it's an area that's worried us um, and bothered us a lot over the last uh, decade almost, but especially over the last five years, because that's the area we work in. Yes. And uh, I don't really prevaricate anymore. And one of the main reasons I don't prevaricate is because we've been consistently saying for many years, and we continue to consistently say, and I, I agree with it, that say a degree warming is going to cause a significant increase in, in, uh, in global in, uh, in severe weather. We've already had somewhere around 0 0.6, 0 0.7, depending on who you want to argue about. I don't think we can any longer say it's going to happen in the future, but by the way, it hasn't happened yet. Yes, yes I chose my words very carefully there because I think uh, the important word was definitive because actually in somewhere like the UK, where our weather is enormously variable and we have a lot of extre you know, so-called extremes, um, and, and, and because it was part of natural climate variability. It's that little bit extra that you add on top all the time. And I couldn't argue that the storms were caused by, that were associated with climate change. You know, but the intensity, I was very robust about actually. And um, as I say, um, we, haven't, we can't do quite the attribution yet because I don't think we have got quite the right models as I showed because we do need to be getting down you're talking about hourly rainfall intensity often. We can't do that unless we're down at the kilometre scale, I believe. And so, you know, it, it still has to be not definitive yet, but it doesn't mean that there is, we don't feel very strongly and know strongly through scientific reasoning that it must be that way. Um, and as I say, the more of us that come out and say that and be unpopular, the better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perhaps time for one last question. No? Okay. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming again. Before we thank Julia one more time for such an excellent seminar, I just want to remind everyone that John Petch uh, will be giving a seminar here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., and I hope you can make it to that as well. Uh, Julia and John will be around most of tomorrow. Uh, we have a fairly full agenda for him, but if uh, you definitely want to get in touch with him, you can. You can just send me a quick email and we'll see what we can do. All right, so please join me again in thanking Julia.